Welcome to today's edition of Tech Tuesday by Full Sail University. My name is Luis Garcia. I'm Vice President of Emerging Technologies at Full Sail. And today's guest is Corey Ryerson, Vice President of Production at Skybar Entertainment. Um, let me give you a quick background of her. Uh, Corey is a graduate of Full Sail University from 1993. Uh, she's an executive that thrives in the intersection of creativity and technology. Her portfolio spans uh, film, television, visual effects, games, interactive media, mixed reality. She leads a team that collaborate across technology, creativity, business, storytelling, design, and marketing. Uh, prior to her current role as Vice President of Production, uh, Skybound, Cordy spent over eight years at Microsoft as the director of Microsoft HoloLens Experiences. And her entertainment credits include movies like Shrek and Independence Day. Her game credits include uh, Star Wars Episode Three and G.I. Joe, The Rise of Cobra, and her technology credits include Microsoft Kinect and Microsoft HoloLens. Uh, Corey has been honored with a Congressional Recognition Award for Dynamic Visual Effects in Film. Uh, she serves on the Board of Directors for the IGDA and is frequently a guest speaker at industry events and conferences. Finally, Corey was inducted into the Full Sail University Hall of Fame in 2009 as part of the very first class of inductees. So never interview somebody like her, pretty amazing. Legit in entertaining and games and in technology and everything in between. Welcome to Tech Tuesday, Cordy. Thank you. It's good to be here with all of you. So this is how it's going to go. I'm going to ask you a few questions for the first 30 minutes. And then folks uh, that are in YouTube, you can send your questions and we go along and my team will get those to us. And I will ask you along the way. So my first question to you, Cordy, is uh, how did you first fall in love with technology? And what do you love the most about it? For me, the, my first opportunity was uh, with the company that I began working at not long after graduating, which is called The Post Group, uh, which is a, a studio out here in Hollywood that did a lot of post-productions uh, for, for films and television and um, advertising. Uh, so not only was it like a 24-hour post-production facility, but we also had like 36 different light workstations that would be used on, on set for film development. And I came in coordinating that kind of um, where those, who was using the equipment, getting the equipment onto location and things of that nature. And so uh, while I was there, I met the vice president um, of the company, a gentleman named Peter Moyer. And Peter was obsessed with technology and uh, we would spend a lot of time talking about filmmaking and storytelling and, and what technology could do for that. And, um, he really was progressive and the post group became one of the very first um, boutique studios uh, in the world to begin the art of digital compositing. Uh, so we, we made a huge purchase. We set up a group within it called the Digital Film Group and we bought two Kodak Cineons, um, which were the first digital compositing systems ever made. Um, they were each a million dollars, so they were heav heavy investment at the time. And then he hired me to come on as his production manager to figure out how we take um, analog film being shot and scan it and digitize it for digital manipulation. Um, and this was everything from splicing it together to integrating, you know, 3D objects from Lightwave. Um, and colorization, all of those different things, and then taking that digital content and re-recording it back out to analog. Because of course, at that time, theaters, even television studio places were still using analog film. So we had to take it from its true beginning physical form, turn it into a digital form, manipulate the snot out of it to enhance the storytelling and enhance the visuals, and then put it back onto analog. And, and that's kind of where I first got bit by how technology could be used as a very powerful resource and tool to enhance um, a narrative or a story that was being shared with people. Uh, and so that's really uh, where it all started for me. And what do you uh, love the most about technology? I love the innovation around it. I love the fact that, um, you know, it combined with entertaining just gives creators new and unique ways to tell stories. Um, and 
a thousand different ways, whether that story be interactive or passive, short in nature to long in nature. Um, the applications we're seeing today, they enable anybody to be a storyteller. The, the impetus for my career of, of moving around from, from film to, to television, to music videos, to video games and up to Microsoft and all of that is through relationships. So, you know, you meet a lot of people along the way. It does take a village to make some of these products and every, everybody has different backgrounds and it was through those connections and through those people that would open doors and new opportunities for me to explore different areas of entertainment, um, which was something I was thirsty for. Because when you think about technology, it does cross all of those. It is one of the cornerstones that they all have in common. They all have technology in common and they all have a story they want to tell. So whether it's an interactive a, you know, piece or a passive experience or a short one or a long one or a, um, you know, one where the, the user is driving and influencing the story. All of those have those two things in common. So I think it just became a, a natural thirst for me to go and experience what those were like in kind of each area of business. But it's very different, right? So I'm, I'm very curious about the transition to Microsoft. And um, and uh, I'm sure you probably uh, moved to Seattle, so uh, in California, and, <laughs> uh, and uh, going from, from LA and working in production, which is very relationship-based, and moving from place to place, and, and to going to an office and uh, interacting with gigs. And, and uh, so I, I, I wonder how was that? Uh, how was that transition or what did you learn from working in a pure technology uh, company? Well, it's, it's interesting you say that. I would say they are not a purely cre uh, tech-driven tech company. They are wow. very, very creative. Um, but I agree with your perspective because that was mine as well. And to be honest, I was at a, uh, I, you know, I'd attend the GDC conference in San Francisco every year, which is the game developer conference. and. I uh, had been going for a while, and I think back in 2008, um, you know, at those conferences, there's so many people running around, it's crazy, and you get these meetings set up for you, and you have no idea what the person looks like, all you have is a name, and you're meeting them in some hotel lobby, and or a coffee shop. And so, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was a high level, uh, a high degree level of hit and miss at, the, at that point in time. And I uh, had a meeting scheduled with somebody and um, I saw this gentleman and I thought it was him and he was meeting somebody else uh, but he thought I was the person he was supposed to meet and oh uh, his and it turned out his name you know his name is Ken Lobb and he was a creative director and a general manager at Microsoft and we just struck up a conversation and and stayed in touch and you know, we got to know each other. We ended up, I don't even know if our other people ended up showing up because we just dug right into conversation, even though that wasn't supposed to be the meeting we were in and um, talked about a lot of different things amongst, you know, storytelling and technology and, you know, just the, the shape that games were taking with consoles and more robust, robust consoles and uh, just kept talking to him for, you know, about another year. And he kept telling me that I should come up to Microsoft and, and visit, you know, and meet some people. And I always teased him. I was like, I know that's where people wear khaki pants and white button down <laughs> shirts and they have pocket protectors. Like there's just no way I'm ever going to fit in that environment. He's like, please just come up. So um, that's what I did. He flew me up and I stayed up there for a couple of days and met a bunch of people and realized just how wrong I was in my perception. Mm. Um, that there was a, a very creative group of people there. And uh, it was around the time that the Connect was in development. So, wow. what a um, so that's, when I, that's when I, so yeah, a year later uh, through that connection, I ended up at Microsoft and started with the shipping of Connect and first party Xbox games. And then after Connect and being so interested in the storytelling, you know, possibilities with that and doing a lot of prototyping and then executing titles for it, um, 
it was clear at that time the technology, while it was awesome, it wasn't for the Twitch gamer, right? It just wasn't going to have that response that a controller does. But there were so many other, like the possibilities of applications, um, you just couldn't stop thinking about them. So that's when we took some of that core technology and began developing incubation on HoloLens, which became a whole different endeavor that I worked on until I left. That's incredible. Well, thank you for saying that about uh, folks from Microsoft. Now you got me really intrigued. Although I, I have I have many friends at Microsoft, but they are the khaki pants type. So I'm hanging out with the <laughs> Well, you know, it's it's a big company. So if if khaki pants are your things, there's plenty of groups that are there <laughs> like that. Um, but there's also a lot of other groups too. Uh, it was a wonderful experience. That's 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 awesome. Um, so you you touch a lot of very uh, iconic uh, projects uh, that you've been part of amazing release releases of movies and games and technology that you know uh, became really really important and is being used played viewed worldwide. Uh, do you ever stop to think about what does that mean to you? I do. Um, I think uh, it's something that sometimes, you know, that I've struggled with in the past because sometimes I think, ah, you know, especially at Microsoft when you have the resources and ability to do good things, you know, like changing the world. I think entertainment is a form of changing the world. And we often see this where we say, ah, is life imitating art or is art imitating life. And there is a there is a form of escapism there that I think, you know, provides, you know, a period of time for people to step outside of whatever, you know, stressors are in their world to go and enjoy something or go and immerse themselves in something. Books have been around, you know, forever. And, and before there were books, there were, you know, Laird's telling, you know, singing stories by fires with 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 music. And so I think storytelling is just part it's critical part of our human nature and, and how we relay things and so I just see now that I just play a you know a small part in, in delivering those stories in new and innovative ways. That's, that's incredible. I, I guess that what is what is the common thread is always has been a storytelling. Yes. That and technology, like how to that do it. Technology. Somebody's got a technology. story to tell. How are they going to tell it? <laughs> so let's talk about technology. Um, uh, you know, I've worked in technology a very long time, and sometimes there are breakthroughs that are silent breakthroughs. People, things, uh, problems that you solve or your team has solved or you're part, somehow part of it that no one ever gets to know about it, but you're very, very proud of it. And uh, it happens a lot when you work in technology. So I always wonder, uh, I'd like to ask for an example of that. Is there an example of a technology breakthrough that uh, you were part of that people don't know about, but you're really proud of? Yes. I think, you know, that would definitely have to go back to time spent on development with HoloLens. HoloLens was definitely a passion project and it had a lot of, it had R&D funding at the beginning um, but there was a lot of, there was a lot of skeptical folks at Microsoft, including Bill Gates at that time. Um, and we would have, we would have to, you know, on a quarterly basis, you know, stand up and present and show our progress with the technology, what we were able to do, what we weren't able to do. And, uh, he was definitely one of the biggest skeptics at, at our early stages of incubation, thinking that we would never be able to have the feature set that we were promising at that time built into a standalone device. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, very smart man, obviously. Uh, and given, you know, where, you know, battery technology was at the time, where silicon was at the time, where, you know, uh, lens technology was at the time, the amount of just like thermal activity and required battery powder. Everybody believed that it was going to have to be tethered. It's going to have to be tethered to a phone or tethered to a PC or, 
you know, in the same way that you see your VR devices today tethered to consoles or what have you. Right. Um, but we just really continued to push forward on that. And it did take an army uh, and, you know, having him turn around in the end and become a true believer uh, with, you know, pats on the back and, and pushing forward. And the fact the company is now on version three uh, is just, I think, a real testament to the innovation, perseverance and passion by that group. Yeah, I mean, that's an incredible device. <laughs> and uh, I have had not the chance to test the, the second version and the other one, the, the third version. And, and, uh, but the vision uh, for the product of, of that kind of power that will not be tethered is, I mean, I agree that's what you have to push for because otherwise it, it doesn't become viable for users to use it. But it's still the, the, the problem set that you have to, to work through is, is insurmountable. Yeah, like how much, you know, how much can something weigh to put on somebody's head and have them wear it for a certain period of time, you know? How, how do we, you know, have them keep their, their real world still very much in context? So they're not walking around bumping in tables or couches or chairs, but still have absolute full peripheral awareness and, as well as blending, you know, with your digital content. You know, how do you interact with it? You're not, you know, there's no mouse to plug, you know, you're not plugging in a mouse to it. So you want to use hands. So you got to use hand gestures. And how do we read people's fingers? How do we read people's hands? Where are they, where are they pointing at to something that technically doesn't really exist in front of you? It's just in digital space. So, so many, so many challenges, <laughs> but fun to I, solve. It was like the ultimate puzzle, you know, like if you really liked puzzles is like, that was the thing you wanted to do. <laughs> we, we, I had a conversation with Tim Naylor and uh, we, he works uh, with uh, Facebook on, on uh, their device. And, mm -hmm. and he says the problem set, the, the same thing you were talking about, battery life, uh, the, how much is get heat? Heat, uh, thermals, yeah. Thermals and, are the uh, problem. <laughs> he says that the variables become very overwhelming very quickly. Uh, the other other part, I, I talked to, uh, we have another graduate, Alejandro, which I'm going to interview in a couple of weeks. Um, and he was with Magic League for a while, which is a, a I wouldn't say a similar device, but it's a, a device that's trying to accomplish for some sure. of the same things that yeah. HoloLens uh, is doing. And he did comment that they did a lot, quite a lot of testing on trying to use the pupils as the input. And, uh, and he said, not gonna happen. Incredibly difficult to do. Uh, more importantly, very tiring on the user. Yes. And I think you so, even see that now sometimes in like interactive space. Like if somebody's engaged in something interactive where they're like, you know, staring, you can forget to blink. Like you can just forget to blink because you're just so like that would happen to me. I know in even VR headsets, um, where you're just you're you're so immersed, you 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 just don't blink, or you know you're blinking too much. Uh, <laughs> there's all kinds of different challenges they face there. That's funny because you know most of those people they're all mixed together now. There is a there is this uh, melting pot of you know, AR and VR enthusiasts, you know, that have worked at Magic Leap that are now at Microsoft and people from Microsoft now at Magic Leap and everything mixed in between, you know, at Facebook and Google and, you know, Apple, everybody's doing it. So it is going to be a thing. And it is something oh, yeah. that I've said for a while, like this is ubiquitous. This is all part of our future. And this, this is going to be a new, a new way of interacting yeah. and storytelling. Ooh. It's gonna Without happen. a doubt, I've been trying to to get Apple to tell us what it, what they're doing, and I visited the headquarters and all that. <laughs> I came close to putting a light on top of them. I was like, "Tell me, you know, you just filed so many patents. What are you gonna do?" But they will not. Uh, but so we'll, we'll have to sit and wait until they release whatever it is that they're working on. <laughs> well, I will give you one tidbit that is public information, so I'm not spoiling anything, but. Uh, when we were developing HoloLens, you know, we had these different business sectors that we were focused on, uh, and and we 
uh, developed partnerships with each, each of those sectors. And one of our partnerships was with the Jet Propulsion Laboratories yeah. uh, for the Mars rover. Um, and at that time we were working with um, the director of that program. Uh, his name is uh, Dr. Jeffrey Norris. And we worked very closely together on uh, you know, what the application with HoloLens could mean for you know, dissecting data from the Mars rover and putting the scientists and geologists on, on the actual planet looking at stuff. Uh, he is at Apple now. Oh. Just, so I'm just saying. Just you know, saying. <laughs> just saying. And he's been there for about three years, so. Yeah. <laughs> It's exciting what they could do because, you know, you know that the M1 probably, you know, heading in that direction because they, they do do the hardware and the software. So, so it'll be interesting. So to follow up on my question on, on, on the technology breakthrough, there's, there's the other side of that equation, which is the problems that we never get to solve because we just didn't have enough time or, or just were so incredibly complex, we just couldn't uh, do it. And I call those the ones that get away. Is there one of those that problems that uh, you didn't get to solve or you, you still want to solve that you haven't been able to? Um, there is, there was one that did get away, uh, but it's not something I'm, in, uh, I'm no longer interested in solving for it because it's already been solved. Um, but that was uh, at a time when I was at PDI, I think it was, uh, and PDI DreamWorks was in 1998 or 99. Um, you know, at that time, the way that they did employment, everything was kind of project contract based. So I work as a contract, I do a set of projects and then you get re-upped um, if they want you to go on to the next project. And at that time, I felt like I had done enough projects and we were transferring a lot of the technology from the Bay down to the Burbank office uh, to build out the, you know, the epicenter at, at Burbank. Uh, and so at that time, I had an opportunity, again, from another networking connection, um, who had gone on to work at Weta, and they were just getting ready to start the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Mm. And at that time, they were doing groundbreaking stuff. They were going to do all of the visual effects in one fell swoop for all three movies from start to end before they had done the rest of the narrative for the movies. Wow. Uh, and that was a challenge that had never been done before. It was like over 3000 visual effect shots in one fell swoop. And so I interviewed for there and I got the job and I had like packed all my stuff up and was getting ready to move to um, Auckland. And uh, I found out I was pregnant. <laughs> I was gonna have a baby. And so I really had to make some tough decisions there because I knew that the job was going to require very long days and um, not really any breaks. And it was going to be a three year stint at minimum to get everything done. And I also, you know, I struggled with that and actually wanting to be, you know, like a good mom and present for my baby. And I wasn't one of those people, you know, I never babysat when I grew up. The first baby I ever held was my own. So I really didn't know anything at all about the whole baby mother thing. And uh, I just had to choose where I wanted to invest my time wisely. So I ended up uh, asking to be let out of that contract and, and uh, bypass that one the opportunity. Away. Yeah. Did, that, did, any, did they do it? Oh yeah, they did it. Yeah. It was amazing. Oh. <laughs> yep, <laughs> they did it. That's interesting. <laughs> I didn't know that about the movie uh, or the tribute, so. Yeah, yeah, that they did everything all in once. They wanted the continuity. Um, and I think they also wanted to set a marker, you know, technology was moving so fast at that time. Like it, we went from a period of like very few, I think like light wave um, and maybe alias was just kind of on the scene to right an exploding market of 3D packages and green screen options and um, you know new camera lenses and new camera tech was coming out at that time. So it's like, okay, we're gonna lock into this point in time and we're gonna do everything 
So we have a visual consistency that is pushing the bleeding edge, um, but will still be relevant by the time one, two, and three come out. What are your impressions on, um, I mean, that technology continues to, to, to develop. There's a couple of technologies right now that I, in, ter in terms of technology contributing to uh, movie making and storytelling that I thought are particularly uh, not only interesting, but but it can carry a, a um, it can change a lot the way we, we produce movies. One of them we're already doing, or the world's already doing, which is the virtual production. You use it, bringing the Unreal Engine, you know, uh, inside the movie making process. Mm -hmm. And uh, but the second one that is kind of tied with that in a way is the meta humans of uh, uh, introduction now, which I started looking at a couple of years ago at CES. I saw a couple of companies were doing digital humans. They were getting really, really close. And um, uh, and then uh, just a few months ago, Unreal uh, uh, unveils their own technology in, uh, for meta humans. And I cannot uh, think, I, I can't stop thinking about merging the two. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and what is guy uh, going to do? Uh, one consequence is definitely you're changing the mix of the pro people that produce the movie. And uh, I think the positions perhaps that will disappear. Now you're gonna bring another kind of artist into the set and uh, um, even programmers even into the set, yeah. it seems like. And um, so what do you think about those technologies and what do you think are the consequences of those technologies? So I, a, I, I love innovation, right? So there is something about that, that, you know, being able to push those edges and you do see, you know, both Unreal and Unity have their own film divisions now where they are yeah. developing specific technology and part of their platform are pushing, you know, filmmaking uh, in a variety of different ways. Again, you, it's, I think, you know, tying it to your second question, there's always that concern, like, you know, anything that we make, and that is the cross to bear, right, is it can be used for good and it can be used for evil. Um, and that's always set at that, at that intersection, right? There's a lot of things that could be said like that, you know, a medical degree could be used for good, <laughs> it could be used for evil. Um, technology is, is, is no different in, in that way. Uh, but I do, I do think some of the things uh, that, I mean, essentially what you're talking about is, is, is humanoid and, and, and kind of humanoid, you know, behavior and how we're pushing AI and how we're pushing, uh, you know, can we cross? I think, you know, forever people in visual storytelling who have that technology or digital background have been trying to break the barrier of the uncanny valley for a long time. Like the uncanny valley used to be a big thing it's getting very, very close now at this point, right? Like it, it is difficult in some scenarios to tell and really the only, you know, it's processing power at the end of the day. Like I think yeah. you can get there visually. It's the question of whether you can package it and process it in a real time environment and still have it hold up is, is still like a North Star that people are shooting for. It's, it's certainly incredible. I just read an article today about uh, voice um, uh, as well. So you can you can now train uh, train a, a machine uh, with your own voice, and then that machine can reproduce other scripts mm -hmm. uh, using your own voice. And uh, which, in sense, if you combine a meta human with that, you can reproduce an actor completely. Mm -hmm. And if you put it in a virtual set and you could probably interact with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it opens a lot of possibilities of uh, also transforms the whole movie making process. Yeah, and I, you know, I don't think it is exclusive to filmmaking either. Like, is it? Oh, no. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when you think about hospitality and the hospitality industry and what could be done there, um, travel, education. I mean, the list don't stop, you know, as far as the verticals where that could be beneficial. Absolutely. 
So let's, let's talk about COVID because everybody has to talk about COVID these days. Uh, and um, I'm very curious about how COVID affects our way of life and uh, moving forward now that we, at least in the United States, it seems like we are getting to the last stages of, of it. Um, but it has transformed how, how we do. Usually we would have been in a studio sitting together having this and here we are, you know, uh, a year and so later, we're still doing this from home. <laughs> and uh, um, um, we, we talked about there's seven people that want the whole world to be back to February 2020. Some people that don't want that and some people that want a combination in, uh, and every business is going through those decisions into what 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 do they want to do with this now that we have a new reality um, we have learned a lot some people have become better more efficient some others uh, have not and that what do you think from the things that transform our life will stay i think I think it is largely dependent, you know, on where, what kind of business sector you work in. You know, I have empathy for people who, you know, require day-to-day -day activity and doing their job and being with other people, you know, some of that is, you know, how hospitality and travel and different things like that were affected. Um, there is no getting around some of that. and. I feel very fortunate that I just happen to work in an industry where, you know, I have seen the opposite of that. You know, I've seen our industry thrive, you know, during, during the shutdown and, you know, innovate new ways to communicate and to team bond and to um, progress forward. Uh, also at a time when uh, much of our society, uh, was sitting at home needing escapism the most, you know, to avoid the depression or the out of work or the what have you. And the appetite for digital content has just been voracious. Um, uh, and that's not just business to business competition. That's just the consumer saying, I demand more content. <laughs> I have already been watched seven shows in two days and I need more content right now. Um, so it's not, it's, you know, there's a, there's a lot of that, 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 uh, you know, has shaped how we're doing things, you know, now and moving forward. And something you said that triggered my brain, you said, you know, people going back to, you know, before I, I don't think there is a going back and it's always disturbed me or read to me like I, this was a, this, this, this situation has been, has fundamentally changed the, the fabric of our world. And we have to adapt and figure out how to move forward. We will create a new reality of what that means now that we have all these other things in place. Um, but I don't, you know, I think it's, 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 uh, I think it's, it's a dangerous game to play to think oh well everybody is looking to this idea of like oh if I just go do x y and z everything will go back to normal go back to normal I've never believed that there is going back you cannot go back you know if I could go back in time then I would have achieved technology excellence and back to the future would be in place and I would have the DeLorean and everybody would be wanting it but that's not the case right, right. I don't have a time machine nobody does um so, well, maybe somebody does, but if they do, I don't know about it. Um, but the, the, we have to move forward, right? And so our next challenge I see is figuring out how to look, you know, systematically across things in the same way you tackle a problem, what things worked, what things didn't, what do we need to change? What, can, what else can we begin to adapt as things become, you know, as they start to come online? Um, and as you and I were talking before, you know, if for me at Skybound, there's so many different verticals of business. Right. There are some people that really need to get in an office and collaborate every day. Like that's the fabric. That's that's their nature. It's it's where they will perform best, and the best ideas will will come about. Um, but many of us have excelled remotely, and not only that, I now have ten new team members. One is a fellow university grad, 
Carrie Lynn Foxwell. Oh. Yep. Just hired as our new head of production um, over all of our video content. She's great. And uh, I have 10 people that I've never met before. Okay. Um, you know, uh, and a lot of them live in totally different places. I don't know when I meet them. It may be years. I don't, I don't, I don't know <laughs> when I will meet, you know, some of these people, but I do feel like I know them because we've been able right. to establish and develop a cadence of communication. Um, and one of the benefits I have seen is when you, uh, and you all must experience this at Full Sail as well, when you have a global company, um, and, the, and that's what we were talking about too, with the online versus being in place, yeah, right? Yeah. You suddenly set a level playing field for all people involved, which wasn't always the case before. Um, you know, when there is a group of people meeting in person and there is one or two lone people on the phone from like the Netherlands or New York or, or wherever we, you know, you have your pockets of business, there wasn't great technology always in place to easily conference in those people and have them be present and have them feel like part of things. And that I think has just been the biggest progression, right? Now you can, I mean, you know, I could just as well be with you. I'm connecting with you now, you know, I see you, you see me and we're having this conversation uh, where I think a lot of times it's like, oh, we'll just put the oh, I can't get the projector working. Just put the person on speakerphone or the TV isn't hooked up or, you know, rats <laughs> in and the cables. Yeah, it's like always something. And you're like, really? Um, and, and now that's just, now it's just a button click away and people can be involved. And so I think that's been the, the biggest highlight as far as that kind of remote working collaboration and, and having everybody feel like they are one unit, no matter where their presence is. That's, that's incredible. Uh, it, it is puzzling to me that it took this long to get to the reach that point. And um, perhaps because there was no motivation to improve on the systems to ensure that everybody was in, included in uh, uh, the example you just gave about the projector. It is. I can't tell you how many places I was like that happened. Yeah. And I, and yet it's still like, oh, is that person still on the phone? Oh no, it's been disconnected. <laughs> and and yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, it's, it's great to see it now come to fruition and be able to collaborate with everyone and everyone has a voice and a, and a presence. Um, we have a question from our audience and um, I was gonna ask a similar question but I prefer this question is even better from Katie. Uh, what tools or devices do you think students should be paying close attention to prepare to the technology industry? Mm. I, think, I think it's important to pay attention to kind of the glasses space right now. I think that, you know, everybody's, you know, everybody's making it and you're going to see a lot of articles out there and some of them are speculation, but some of them are going to have more specifics. Um, clearly, Microsoft is very public about what they're making. Um, Google and Apple less so. Uh, you see, you know, they're very uh, much more um, opaque in the information that they've released so far. But it's not just these companies. Like there used to be just these, like you know, the magic for Facebook, um, and then you started seeing things like Magic Leap, but it's not just those companies now. Now you're starting to see hardware manufacturers um, come up with their version of devices. So these are hardware first companies. So what you've seen before is mostly software first companies that are coming up with the hardware. Now you're seeing the hardware first companies get into the software game. And so I think it's just gonna be an interesting space to watch and keep your eye on um, as far as what everybody's doing. Um, and not just from, technical specs per se, but I think one of the biggest things to keep a, an eye on is the, is the user interface and the user experience. Um, and I say that because, you know, when, you know, Apple was not the first to invent touch, but they were the first to bring it to market and it revolutionized the world. And now, none of us know what we do if we weren't touching our phones all the time. So 
there's something there's something there and that next evolution is going to come and it's going to have to come with these headsets like what what is the interaction model what is the user experience what is the easiest transition from you know the things we do today to the things that we could do tomorrow and learn with a low barrier to entry because that's really what you need to embrace the consumer market and so i'd say that'd be a very interesting space to watch absolutely i mean no no other app, apple was not the first one to introduce touch they were not the first ones to introduce the mouse either i know and, um, <laughs> and, and, uh, and graphic i just interface there's so many things that they were not first on and uh, but what they do really really well is in creating an experience that people can adopt easily and that's why i'm very eager to see what they do in the in the in the device spaces for for uh visualization and like an ar device or a vr device or a combination of the two uh because in my mind they're really good at introducing new screens right well it makes you pay attention to marketing right it tells you never yeah. underestimate the power of marketing because clearly we as consumers if you introduce a bunch of different colors to us we will snap that stuff up in a heartbeat <laughs> you mean i can have this in purple now i'm all in okay <laughs> absolutely with, with absolutely no further upgrades just a yeah. color swatch change yeah not the first one on mp3 not the first one with a watch no, yeah. but but somehow they make it work. I mean, mm -hmm. and um, so it's it's very very cool to see what they could do. Um, and they know so, they know how to tell that story to the consumer in an yeah. appealing way. In an appealing way, they just have that nailed. I'd say they definitely got the secret sauce there. Absolutely. It's just, you never refer. You don't think of them as a computer company. No. Like, they're a brand. Yeah. But that you more. wear like Nike. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, uh, doing projects across industries like you have and, uh, and leading teams that are, I imagine, very different in makeup. And um, yeah, I, I imagine that had, you have to develop certain traits as a leader uh, that you could take from, from venture to venture. Um, what do you think that is? But what things have I learned as a as a yeah leader? that you can apply to other teams because if, if developing a people working with people is, is probably one of the biggest your biggest strength for what I I, I gathered from speaking to you at, at my research and you're very proud of how you bring people together to solve a yeah. problem and yeah. uh, and I and obviously you do it really really well so. What do you think that is that you bring that uh, inspires people to come together to solve a problem, no matter what the problem is and what industry it is? I, I think it's a it's a it's a handful of things. So, like if you you know if you were a cook and you were gonna you know create your own custom spice, you know, like what spices would you put in, you know, to your to your package that makes your dish taste great? I think it's a lot of putting together a, a diverse group. And when I say that, I mean diversity in thought, right? Um, based on people's backgrounds, regions, all different types of things uh, creates diversity of thought. Um, as a matter of fact, just a quick interlude at Microsoft, they were having a problem with their, with their internship program for a while because they weren't seeing the results. It wasn't generating the results that they wanted. And then you took one look brief at it and it's like, oh, because they only recruit from the same five schools every year and they recruit based on the same data every year. So they were just getting the same human over and over and over again. Right. After the it's like, hey, let's not do that. Let's let them branch out and get a bunch of different people in and change up the program and change up the, you know, the dynamics and private schools and public schools and, you know, different countries and all this different stuff. And it really just fundamentally changed the program. So diversity of thought, I think, is one of the key ingredients. Um, I don't want to have a group of people problem solving that all think the same way. Um, so that can get you into trouble. Uh, the second is setting clear goals. Because if you don't have clear goals to govern a group of body that has diverse thinking, 
there's nothing kind of tethering them together. There's got to be a common purpose, a common goal to solve, and just making sure that that's clear uh, and, and relatable, that you can storytell it easily and everybody's like, aha, yes, I understand, I got it, uh, I think is important. Um, and the third is listening. I know it sounds weird, but it's true. Uh, I don't think there is enough listening that, that happens. And when you do have a diverse group of folks working to problem solve something, it's very important to listen um, to all of the different perspectives. Everybody has a voice um, just to understand and pick a path, you know, navigation or, or solving whatever problem it is you're trying to solve. And I think that's applicable towards anything, you know, whether it's a, you know, whatever it is. I don't care if it's building a play set in a public park or, uh, you know, doing some kind of crazy, uh, you know, technology. It's uh, what type, what group of people do you put together to problem solve? How do you give them the tools to solve the problem effectively, such as goals? And then how do you ensure they're reaching their best is by listening to them and being able to incorporate those different opinions into the direction of the project. What a great answer. Thank you so much. I, 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 when I grow up, I really want to be more like you. <laughs> really, really mean that. Okay, then we're going to go play some golf. Get ready. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, we're reaching our end here and there's a question that I, 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 I love to ask always about the future because I, I, I feel that we are in a, in, even though technology has been around for the last 50 years in a very present way, I think that there has been different uh, goals that that technology have achieved. So if if, if we first was to get a computer in everybody's uh, in everybody's home, and then it was to connect those computers, and and then it was to uh, to make sure it was social and it was in your pocket. I think that right now we are entering an era where um, we are building on top of 50 years of innovation, and we got a real real shot at solving very complex problems that uh, and the world is not free of, of problems to be solved and uh, and now we just experienced how a process that would take five six years uh in some cases 10 years to you know to develop vaccines it was done in a matter of months and um and that's because of 50 years of innovation so that's just an example of what could be possible now in the next 20, 30 years. So, um, so what do you think, what do you see in technology today that gets you really excited about the future? Well, one of the things that you said is, uh, you know, the help and being able to do that, I think a key factor there is motivation. I think, you know, without that drive, without the motivation to make that kind of change, you just don't see it, right? And yeah. sometimes you just have a problem that, that smacks everybody in the face. And boy, we suddenly get very motivated around that, don't we? <laughs> Nobody likes that. So I think motivation is, is definitely key to continue to drive some of that forward. Um, some of the things that I get excited about, um, which are equally, you know, you, you also said, it's, we certainly have enough problems to solve, right? Like, like there's enough problems to go around. I think it's important to, remember that as we create, you know, like there's ramifications to everything. And this kind of goes back to the good and evil point, right? So with every new thing that comes out, there is a potential of, of being used in, in very, you know, unsavory or, you know, unlawful ways. And that is a, a responsibility that is very easy to, you know, put in the back of your mind when you're very excited and you have a very different kind of specific goal, you know, put in front of you for what you want to achieve. Um, but I think there is a responsibility there. And I think we all, you know, we all have to carry it um, and think about what it is that we're putting out there. And so with that said, one of the areas that I'm excited about and frightened about at the same time is just the future of AI. I think that's probably one of the most exciting things, I don't know if you have a home system. I certainly have a home system. I talk to it all the time. Um, you know, I've, it's very helpful. It's like having a personal assistant now. You know, I have a personal assistant. 
it just happens to be a robot that comes out of a speaker that reminds me to do things and helps me not burn things when I'm cooking it and tells me what day it is and what the forecast is like and what my meeting schedule is for the day and what other appointments I may have. Like uh, that is, um, that is to me is a game changer. And uh, it's, you know, it's just getting more and more intelligent. We're seeing it used, you know, many times. And right now, I think, you know, in the world of AI, we're at that uncanny valley, right? Where sometimes we think we're talking to a human and then we figure out it's a robot and it really pisses mm -hmm. us off. And then <laughs> sometimes, you know, the, the, the AI is just faulty and it's not very good. And then you get mad at the technology. Um, but I think, I think there are gonna be some big strides in that in the next, you know, five to 10 years. And, um, you know, I think different places, you know, you look at even Boston Dynamics, you know, with, you know, yeah. what they were doing with robots, that requires also an intelligent AI basis in the background. And, yeah. you know, I was excited and sad, but also equally understood when, the, you know, when the New York Police Department tried to deploy you know, robots to keep humans safer, but there was such a public outcry for that. It was really no different than kind of where we were when Google first came out with Google Glass and society went, oh, you don't, go <laughs> away. Exactly. Uh, so I think we're kind of at that same place now right. with like robots and AI. Um, and so it's gonna be very interesting to see how that, you know, how we're able to bridge the gap over the next 10 years. No, thank you so, so much for that thoughtful answer. Uh, and for those of you listening, you do have a voice as, as Cordy say, and hopefully you, you'll be with leaders like her that will listen, but you do have a voice. And when somebody's creating a technology and you're being part of it, just raise your head and say, should we create this? You and it's incredible. Yeah. You have to ask. I think we all have a responsibility uh, on that. So uh, thank you for that, uh, for that answer. This, this is the end of our conversation today. I, I wanna thank you so much for your time. And uh, time is the one thing that we all have equally. So I really appreciate that you spent some of yours uh, with us. And thank you everyone that came in today and those that are gonna watch this later. Uh, thank you for spending your time with us. Uh, we'll be back, I think in uh, two or four weeks uh, with another, uh, another one of our, of our graduates. Uh, thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you.